Uh, it's already there, but it's just not visible yet. I just want the TA who manages the marking system to, uh, to look over it before uh, I post it, because I want to make sure there's nothing in the testing portion that's going to cause any difficulties. But uh, it'll be in the next slide today or tomorrow, basically. Um, how do you like the submission server? No. <laughs> I can't let you know what bugs what bugs I'm looking for because that's the point of testing. I mean, you have an implementation that doesn't work. Well, and then let us know after you caught them because then I, if I catch one bug, I got one at two, and then I add something, I just lost it. Just make another test. Right. So you can you can have you know test one zero one. If that catches one of the bugs, then start making test one zero two. That'll prevent the other one, the other bug will, will never, never get lost. Sorry, but the, the, the whole point is, is basically you have an implementation and you want to know if it works. You, you, in general, you don't even know that there are bugs or that you found them all. Uh, you just have to test as thoroughly as you can without any feedback at all, basically. Um, so this is a, this is sort of, sort of midway in the case. Yeah? Are we keeping the same format for the test files? Because at first I thought we were making a test one dash zero question number. Yeah. I thought we had to switch it because of the way the question was for the Yeah, no, it's the, the question number and then zero one, zero two, zero three. So we're doing that for every assignment? No, because uh, that's the only one that takes files as input. Okay. So for the next assignment, you'll be running functions that test the functionality of a specific data structure. Uh, so, you know. It's, you'll have some function test this, which takes a list as an argument, and it does a bunch of things to that list to see if it's uh, working correctly and if it's working fast enough and, and all of these things. Um, so that, that's the only one that you have to file. Yeah? Is this key going to be the same? Yes, your submission key won't change unless you have some kind of security problem uh, like you gave away your submission key or posted it online, uh, and then we can change it manually for you. But uh, your submission key is the same. Yeah. You lower the time, we have to wait to submit again. Uh, I might lower it to two minutes, but again, I don't want you using this thing as your tester. I mean, it's, it's your job to design test cases. Uh, and so I don't want you using this thing to do your testing. It's, uh, you should really have an implementation that's pretty much good to go, um, rather than just hacking away at it and resubmitting, hacking away and resubmitting. Uh, you should have tested it thoroughly before you do that. So I might lower it a bit, uh, and it's not even a question of resources anymore. This new server is actually quite fast. Um, we did the rerun of the, the assignments after the submission deadline, and nobody's not paying, so there's no issue of the server being slow near the submission time. But again, uh, I don't want you using it as a crutch for testing. Okay. So about 245 people submitted. The class enrollment is about 265, uh, so that's good. The average mark was uh, 46 point something out of 54, so around 85% was the average on the one. So it seems to be working well. Um, in some ways a little bit better than last year, uh, because now there is a little bit of distribution of marks. Last year, basically, everybody just used the tester to do their testing. Um, there was none of this make your own test cases, and pretty much everybody got 40 on 40. They, they passed all their tests but never did any of their, their own testing. So um, I think this is a little bit better, actually, even though the, it may not feel better for you guys. We'd rather have 100% on the assignment rather than 85, but, uh, but that's, that's not the best thing to about. Um, OK, questions about material from last class? So uh, the plan is to finish up uh, this dual array index talk about something called the Rudish Array Stack, and that'll set us up next class where I can go over the assignment. So this will be a good class to, to attend. 
uh, next class, uh, where I go in detail over the, uh, the next assignment, uh, to give you a, an idea of, of what's, what's being asked of you. Um, yeah, so uh, the videos, I think I've got the, uh, the whole workflow worked out now. Um, should be able to get them up within a day after We're good there as well. At least one of you looked at the video and found it helpful. So that's worth continuing. Uh, if one out of 260 students thinks it's good, then it's worth my time. Uh, all right, so last class we were looking at this data structure. It was called a dual array deck. Actually, do you, do you prefer the chalkboard lights on? Okay. Messes up the video, but I'd rather the class be better than the, the video. Uh, we're looking at this thing called the dual array deck, and that is something that you get by gluing together two stacks. You call them front and back, and you glue them together with their fast ends facing out. Uh, if you look at the indices internally of these stacks, these, these things, so this is index 0 in the back, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on, and the front is reversed, so it's the other way. And the list itself you view as having these indices. So the, the list that you're implementing looks like this. And so uh, the nice thing about this is that the small indices starting at zero are near the, the end of the front queue, so they're fast to modify, uh, fast to add and remove things here. And the large indices, the ones close to end, well, they're, they're near the end of the back queue, so they're, they're fast to modify. And we always maintain that front dot size uh, is less than three times, uh, sorry, it is, uh, yeah, less than or equal to three times. Black dot size is a two plus one here. Or uh, black dot size is less than or equal. So we always maintain this invariant that they both have about the same size. So not, you don't have one that has n elements in it and one that's empty. Um, they're really close to the same size. They, they don't differ by more than a factor of three. This is a little bit of a fake because, of course, there's one time when this cannot be true, and that's when you have only one element in this data structure. It either has to be in the front or it has to be in the back, in which case the one that has it is infinitely larger than the one that doesn't. But that's the only case when you don't, uh, you don't have this, this issue when there's only one, one element, and that's not a, not a problem. Okay? So basically, um, the way it works is when you want to add or remove something, you figure out whether the index you're adding or removing is in the front array or it's in the back array, and you add or remove at the appropriate place. Okay. So what we'd like to know is, well, um, so it basically looks, uh, well, I don't want to write the code, but uh, you, you get the idea. So if I want to add anywhere uh, in the indices between 0 and 6, that turns into an add in the front, uh, in this case. And if I want to add anywhere in the indices uh, 7 up to uh, 14, then that would, uh, that would happen at the back. And after each add or remove operation, you check this condition. And if this condition is not true, then you start with brand new, fresh, uh, fresh 
stacks, where you split the elements perfectly evenly across both stacks. So there's this rebalance operation that happens that, uh, that rebalances the elements easily. Uh, but the first thing I'd like to do is analyze, let's say, the cost of inserting into this, this thing. So uh, without rebalancing. So let's look at uh, cost of add i x, uh, and that's discounting rebalance. And now this is a little bit funny the way you have to do this analysis uh, because really you're not always sure what the cost is unless i is in a certain range. So. Uh, if this is the case, if these two things never differ by more than a factor of uh, three, then what can you tell me if I is in the range zero up to n over four? Where would I find that index if I is in that range? Yep. It has to be in the front. Because if the difference in size is at most a factor of three, that means that the front holds at least one quarter of the elements. Right? So the picture, in the worst case, if the front were as small as possible, this would be of size n over 4, and this would be of size 3n over 4. If the situation ever gets any worse than this, more unbalanced than this, then we rebalance it. So that this, this isn't the case anymore. So if i is in the range 0 up to n over 4, then, uh, then maybe less than n over 4 doesn't matter too much, then we know it's in the front. And it's really, uh, you know, the picture looks like this, so we know that i is somewhere like this. So how long does it take to add something at that position in the front? How many elements get displaced by that? Well, suppose I wanted to add something at position 4 uh, in this whole list. That means it gets added at position 2 in the front. In, a, in an array stack, which is the same thing as an array list, when you insert at position i, which elements have to move? Ah, sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3, and which, which index set? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. These, this 0, 1, 2, 3, which in the, internally, this thing sees as, uh, well, actually, it, it's 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, 2, 3, 4, 5, and, and 6. So this is actually, these elements here will get shifted in one position to the left to make room for the new guy that we're inserting here. And how many elements is that? So it's 4 in this case. In general, it's i. So, in general, if i is there, that means uh, i is in front. And so, that means we shift i elements, and the whole thing takes order i prime. All right, so then there's a symmetric case to this. So if i is quite small, less than a quarter of n, then we know where it is, it's in the front. If i is quite big, uh, so let's say i is between 3n over 4 and n, well, where is it then? It's in the back, 3n over 4. Well, that's the same picture again with these sides reverse. In the worst case, you know, the back has only these n over 4 elements in it, and this guy has 3n over 4 elements. But that still means the 
back holds all the indices from 3 and over 4 up to n. So that means i is in the back. And how many elements can we shift then? Yeah. We shift n minus i elements. Because we have a picture like this where i is you know, over on this side. Who do we shift? Well, we shift all this element and the ones that come after it. So that pushes these guys here. And that's really n minus i elements. So that means shift n minus i items, which means this takes order n minus i time. So we know what happens if i is really small. We know what happens if i is really big. Uh, but there's a gap in between here, right? Uh, between n over 4 and 3n over 4, there's still a big gap. And when that when i is in that range, we don't know whether it's going to be in the front or the back. And so we don't know exactly how much it's going to, uh, how many elements are going to get shifted. But here's the thing. Uh, n over 4 is less than i is less than 3n over 4. Well, we don't know where i is. But it doesn't matter uh, really because i is neither close to the close to n or close to uh, close to zero. So I don't know, we shift let's say something silly. At most uh, let's be wild n Actually, only three out of the four, but we might as well even say n. It's not more than n, but it's not even more than n items stored there. So that means it takes order n time. So that's an upper bound, n. But if we look at i, uh, well, well let's, let's leave it at that for now. Let's see if we can write this in a, in a nice way. Uh, combine all this into one nice expression. So if i is between 0 and n over 4, it's order i time. If it's between 3 n over 4 and n, then it's order n minus i time. And so my claim is actually all of this, no matter which case it is, it's order the min i and n minus i. So why is that? So it's clear that if i is in this range, then the min of these two values is i, right? If i is between you know, 0 and quarter n, then i is smaller than n minus i. And in the other range, if i is you know, close to the end, if it's between 3 quarters n and n, then n minus i is the, the smallest one. So it's true for these two ranges here. It's just this one in the middle. But in the middle here, what we have is that uh, the min of i and n minus i, that's actually bigger than, uh, actually, yeah, it's really bigger than n over 4. Right? If i is bigger than n over 4 and smaller than 3 n over 4, you look at i, well, it's bigger than n over 4. And you look at n minus i, well, because of this, it's also bigger than n over 4. And so, uh, so the min of i and n minus i is bigger than n over 4. And we shift at most order n elements, which is you know, some constant times n also. Uh, and so this, this min actually covers the middle case as well. So the, the min of i and n minus i is, is at least n over 4. And we, in this case, do order n work. And so the uh, the, we, we, we do the order of the min of i and, and n minus i. We give up the factor of 4. If you wanted to be a little more careful, this is actually 3n over 4. Um, then we give up a, a factor of 3. Okay? So 
basically uh, fast if it's near the front, fast if it's near the back, and if it's in the middle, it's going to be slow anyway. Uh, so, so who cares? Okay. Questions?
the two uh, the two lists get off, off filter. One gets much bigger than the other. You may end up doing one of these, these rebalancing. Uh, so the question is, well, how do we know how much that costs when you do a whole bunch of these operations? And actually, there's a nice trick for this. We'll define something called the, uh, the potential. And the potential, we'll just define it by a formula. It's the difference in size between the front and the back. So we take the absolute value, so it's really always the positive part and the difference in size. So, uh, so when they, they become very different in size, the potential gets big. And when they're the same size, the potential is small. Okay. Good. Now, if you remember the way we analyzed uh, the resizing in array stacks, we had these pictures that looked like this. There is the now part of the picture when we're just about to do a resize. And we're just about to do a resize because we have a bad imbalance. Something like this. And there's the then part of the picture. The then part of the picture was just after the last rebalance. So I don't know exactly what that size was. It may not, maybe much less than the current value of n, maybe much bigger, maybe the same, who knows. But it was the same on both sides. So I don't know, we can call this uh, n prime over 2 and n prime over 2, not necessarily any relationship between it m prime, the old number of elements, and, and the current number of elements. But uh, we can look at the potentials here. So what was the potential then after that last resource? What's the difference in size here? Zero. They're both the same size. So the potential was zero. Actually, uh, it could also be one. Because if n prime is odd, the best we can do is to be off by one on the one side. Uh, so what about now? What's the potential? What's the difference between 3n over 4 and n over 4? n over 2. So the potential now Okay, good. So back then it was zero. Last time we did a rebalance, it was zero. And now it's worked its way up to n over two. Now what could cause the potential to change? What is it that makes the potential change? Yeah, the potential changes because this, the number of elements in the front or the back changes. And that only happens when we add or remove elements. And when we add an item, how much can the potential change by? It's the most one. We, the, we add it to the front or we add it to the back, so that means the potential increases by at most one. You could even go down, but that's, that's not what we're worried about. And when we remove an element, the same thing. We remove it either from the front or we remove it from the back. So that increases the difference by at most one. It could also decrease it, but that's not, not so important. The important thing is here that the potential climbed from zero all the way up to n over two, which means at least n 
in over to add or remove <coughs> operations happen between now and then. So in the time between these two rebuilds, at least n over 2 add or remove operations happen. And now, during this rebuild, this is the expensive thing, we have to copy n elements. <coughs> so the number of elements that we're copying is only twice the number of add and remove operations that happened in the meantime, since the last time we had to do this. And if you think back you know, to the, the, the previous argument, that's the whole ingredient that we needed. That, that's all that we, we had to look at. We just made this timeline that started at zero, went up to M. We kicked off these uh, operations where a rebalance happens. And what we argued is that if you copy, you know, N I elements here, then the number of operations that happen between this was at least N I over two. And we have exactly the same situation again. Uh, and so we, we finish the analysis the same way. And the, the final result is uh, we get to append something to this theorem with the furthermore clause. Uh, if we start with an empty dual array deck and perform. Any sequence of M add and remove operations and we spend at most.
So what I would like to look at in the rest of the class is uh, something a little bit different. So it's got some nice stories in it. That is, so we're basically following the book right now, section by section. Uh, and that's something called the Rubish Erase Act. And the point of the Rubish Erase Act is that it makes a memory efficient list implementation. So what does it mean to be memory efficient? Well, if we look at, you know, the simplest thing we looked at was this array list slash array stack. Uh, it was one big array, and you store the list element in it. And, you know, typical picture is maybe Here's your array, here's the actual item you're storing in the list, and there's this big empty section of the array at the end, this unused section. So there's this part that's used to store the data. That's sort of necessary. If you want to store a bunch of items, you need enough memory to store them. But then there's this part here, which we call wasted space. picture with an array stack is, uh, is there's a lot of wasted space. A good fraction of the array is wasted. So, in fact, at the worst time, if you're about to shrink it, uh, this could be as big as 2n. Right? Because this is n, the number of elements actually stored in your list. And we don't shrink this thing until it becomes uh, one third, one third, uh, only one third full or two thirds empty. So that would make this empty spot here as big as 2n. So for every item that you're storing, you're actually storing, you have these two empty wasted array locations. Um, so it could be as big as 2n, but typically it's some, usually some constant times n. You know, right after you resize, it's, it, the wasted space is exactly n. You're wasting as much as you're storing. Um, and as it fills up, you get less and less wasted space and you have to expand it again. <laughs> but, uh, but that seems like a lot. Uh, I mean, it's not terrible, but it does mean that if you're really working on crunching some big data set, uh, you know, let's think about uh, the human genome <clears throat> is, uh, what, three and a half billion uh, symbols? Uh, so three and a half billion, so that's like 3.5 gigabytes. So many of you probably have a laptop that could store 3.5 gigabytes uh, in RAM. Uh, okay, but if you store this thing in one of these things, well, not only do you have to be prepared to store 3.5 gigabytes, but you actually need to be prepared to store 10.5 gigabytes. And most laptops, even fairly high-end ones now, come with about eight gigs. So you're not quite going to make it if you use this thing. So uh, the constants do matter. I mean, if you're really pushing the limits, the constants matter. Uh, it would be nice if you didn't have all this, this extra wasted space. So the Rudish Array Stack uh, tries to address this, and it uses as only on the order of square root n wasted space. And we'll see actually that this is the best we can do. If you want to have any data structure that allows you to add and remove things, then you'll need square root n wasted space. So what does it look like? It's pretty simple. It's a 
the list. And it's a list of arrays. The first array is an array of length one. The second array is an array of length two. The third array is an array of length three. And the fourth one is an array of length four. So let's call this thing. This list here, which stores arrays, we'll call this thing blocks. And what you have is that blocks at position i is an array of length i plus 1, because that's just a function of zero based indexing. This is position 0, 1, 2. Seven. And <coughs> at position zero, you find a block of length one. At position one, you find a block of length two. And now, where are the list, the actual list items stored? Well, they're stored in these arrays. Three, four, five, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, and, uh, and so on all the way up until the last block, I think we call that uh, block R minus 1, which stores uh, up to, so this is an array of length R, and so it stores some stuff. And at the end of this, so at the end of this list, there's maybe an extra block or so. So that's what this thing looks like. Uh, all right. So the whole point of this is that it's supposed to save space, which it doesn't quite look like it's doing yet. Because well, if you look at an array list, uh, just sort of one single array, that was pretty good. You needed one pointer to that array, and that was it. Now we have a whole bunch of these arrays. And for each one of those, we have a pointer to it. And these pointers here, well, they're definitely not data that's stored in the list. So they're, they're some kind of wasted space. But we better make sure there's not too many of these things. Um, so what we'd like to know is if we're storing n items, uh, how big is this value of r? But it's actually a little bit easier if uh, to ask, how many items can we store in our box? We can work backwards then and find the relationship between n and r. So that'll tell us the maximum value of n for, uh, for our blocks. So how many items can we store if we have only one block? What if we have two blocks? Three. What if we have three blocks? Six. And if we have four blocks? And in general, if we have our blocks, we can store this many items. One plus two plus three plus four plus five all the way up to R. So now it's story time. Uh, <clears throat> you guys heard of uh, Carl Jobs? His, his picture is on the, uh, uh, well, it used to be on German Money. Um, I don't know if it's made it onto any uh, Euros yet. Uh, probably one of the, if not the, one of the uh, greatest mathematicians ever, most mathematically gifted individuals ever. Uh, so the story, which may or may not be true, is that uh, when Gauss was a boy, nine years old, he went to a school, uh, well he went to school like everybody else, uh, probably better than normal 
school. And his teacher got tired of teaching one day and wanted to have a cigarette break or a pipe break or whatever they smoked back then. Uh, and so, you know, and the way kids did things, they didn't really have paper, that was expensive. They had little chalkboards uh, with, you know, little pieces of chalk. And that's the way they did things like calculations and uh, spelling and whatever else. So he said, uh, okay, I want to break. So while I'm gone, you guys uh, add up these numbers, one, two, three, and he put R equal to 100 here. And the story goes that uh, by the time he finished uh, asking the question, he also put up his hand and gave the answer. So he added up these 100 numbers. Uh, and the, the time it takes to ask the question faster than, than I did. Uh, so he discovered this himself. Uh, now, of course, he didn't just do long addition here. He discovered a formula for this. And the formula is really nice because uh, once you see how it's derived, then you can remember it forever. So here's how you calculate this sum. Uh, you just draw it in a bunch of boxes and count the number of boxes. So there's the first term, it's one box. Here's the second term, it's two boxes. Here's the third term, three boxes. Here's the fourth term, it's four boxes. And here is the rth term. How many boxes in the earth term? R. Okay, so the question we're trying to figure out is how many boxes are in this picture? Doesn't look any easier. Until you notice that you can take this whole picture and turn it 180 degrees, and now you have two pieces that fit together nicely. So if you turn this 180 degrees, this one box here ends up down here. And these two boxes, they end up right here, and they fit together perfectly with the previous row, or touching the previous row. And the three end up here, and they fit together perfectly. And finally, the R boxes, they end up over here. Fitting in nicely with this. Okay, so now we have a picture that's much easier to count the number of boxes because it's a rectangle. Uh, so, how long is this side of the rectangle? R. How long is this side of the rectangle? R plus one. So the number of boxes in this picture is R times R plus one. But wait a minute, that's not the number of boxes we wanted. That's just the number of boxes that's convenient to count. Uh, we just want the white boxes. How many of those are there? Same as the number of blue boxes. And when you add those two things together, you get r times r plus 1. So it must be the half of the number. So Gauss figured this out and then we discovered so 100 times 101 divided by 2. So that's what, 50 50 or something? 5,050. Uh, we figured this out in whatever, a few seconds, uh, or more likely we knew it beforehand and, uh, and foiled the teacher this way. So the sad part of the story is that the teacher never got to have a cigarette that day. Okay, so now you know this and you'll remember it forever. So how many items can we store if we have R blocks? It's R times R plus 1 divided by 2. Okay, and you know, a longer way to write that is something like uh, r squared over 2 plus r over 2, and that's certainly bigger than uh, r squared. So we can store about r squared over 2 items in our blocks. So if we want to store n items, 
we need is that it would be good enough if r squared over 2 is bigger than n, uh, which is like uh, r squared is bigger than 2n, which is the same thing as saying uh, uh, r is bigger than the square root of 2n. So it takes square roots on both sides. All right. Well, that's good. So this value of r here, we only need r to be, let's say, bigger than uh, the square root of 2n. So that's uh, on the order of the square root of n. That's tiny. So you know, if n is a million, then this is square root 2 times 1,000. So if n is a million, think of a, an array stack. That might waste a million or two million array locations. Uh, this thing will race will use about, uh, waste about 1,440 of it. So that's much less than, uh, than, than n. OK, so this blocks here, even though this is all waste in space, there's really, no, we don't need very many of them. Um, all right. So uh, that's great. So we can store lots of stuff in here without much wasted space. Uh, is there anywhere else that there might be some space wasted? Yeah? In yeah, this last block, it may not be completely full, right? So really, the picture could look like this. Like you just have to create that block because you have one element more than the fit in the, the previous block. So now you're wasting all these memory locations. But that's only about r memory locations. And r only needs to be about the square root of 2n. So again, that's only, if n is a million, that's only about 1,500 instead of a million. So that's still much, much smaller than you know, some constant times, times n. And actually, it turns out for us that it's kind of handy to have, uh, to allow this data structure to have uh, one block at the end, which is completely empty, and, uh, and one which is partially empty. So we may waste these last two blocks, but they're only of size of R and R plus one. So we're only looking at something like, you count all this, and all this, and all this, only something like three times the square root of time. Nothing. Nothing big at all compared to that. Okay. So this looks great. Uh, see any difficulties here? What are the things we do with lists? We get, set, we add and remove. So all of these things take an argument i which is the index into the list. So uh, how, how do we go from an index i to figuring out, oh, this is the block that we want? Elements 
chord in the list uh, 0 up through B. So this is actually B plus 1 list.
three B. Uh, all, this is all divided by two, and you get a two. Um, then you subtract this, this one. Uh, so you get this this quadratic equation, uh, and you can solve quadratic equations, right? So you have a, a quadratic equation that's uh, that's equal to a specific value of i. So this is just a quadratic equation. And uh, there's a formula that finds two solutions for it. That's a little bit weird. So you just plug in the formula for the quadratic equation. And if you remember that formula, there's a plus or minus in it. So this thing finds two solutions which is a little bit creepy because that says the block you're looking for is this block, so i is stored in this block and in this other block. Uh, so that should worry you if you did something wrong. Um, but no, actually, if you look at one of those solutions, you'll see that it's always negative. Uh, so that's sort of telling you something like, well, if you reflected this thing and had other blocks going out in the other direction, then it would be in one of the negative blocks. But we don't care. We just want the positive solution. And uh, so that'll give you something like, you know, if I solve this with, uh, for i equals 7, I might get some number like, uh, you know, I might solve this equation for i equals 7, I might get uh, 2.32623, whatever. Um, and all that tells me is that, well, 2 is not, uh, the integer 2 block is not big enough. It doesn't have what I need. I just take the ceiling of this, and the thing that I'm looking for is in this block. Okay. Um, so you get this just by solving a, a quadratic equation, and taking the ceiling of the solution tells you the index of the block that you're looking for. All right. Uh, so that tells us which block is storing the data we want. Um, how do we know where it is in that block? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we are looking for the label i across all these blocks. Um, and we found that we're in here maybe in block b equals 3. So this thing starts at 6. So why does it start at 6? Well, it starts at 6 because there's 6 elements in all of the previous blocks. And what's 6? Well, that, you know what 6 is. That's the B. Uh, this is B. So this is the B times B plus 1 over, uh, over 2. Uh, so once we know the value of B for this block, we know how many values are in all the preceding blocks. That's the formula there. Uh, so we subtract that off, and that tells us what the index is in this, this block. So it's, uh, it's really non, <coughs> somehow non-trivial. I mean, you needed finally, uh, you know, for the first time ever, you needed the quadratic formula to do something in, uh, in computer science or in, in programming. It's, it's really uh, a useful, useful thing here. So, uh, all right. So the rest of it then is, uh, is everything else is fairly straightforward. It, uh, it just works like everything else, uh, like an array stack. <laughs>
really about uh, that is a track on all of the number of items in these preceding blocks, and that gives you the index J into this array, and you just return. Get code is fairly simple. Modulo in here, there's this solution to a quadratic equation which has a spur root in it. It's a little bit annoying, but uh, it's, uh, it can be done quickly enough. Mm -hmm. so any questions so far? That's get and set, you can figure out the similar, it computes the V and the J that it needs and then it changes the value of that location in the array. Uh, it's really all just about getting these, these values. And you know what sort of looks like it would be hard at first uh, is something like uh, adding a position on it. Uh, because We want to add a position i, and position i happens to be here. And then that means we need to shift a bunch of stuff out of the way, and the shifting is a little bit funny because it kind of takes this guy and plops him over here, and then shifts this guy over, and this guy over, and this guy over, and then this guy gets plopped into the next row, and so on. So it looks like you would have, you know, a couple of nested for loops that count from one block to the next and then do the shifting inside the block. But actually, because we already have get and set operations, we can just use those. So really it looks like something after balance checking, you just do something like uh, for uh, i is equal to n and minus one. Take the element at position j, j and move it to position j plus 1. The fact that this is cascading across these different arrays in different places, that's all hinted by the fact that you have get and set methods to figure out where to, to put this thing. Um, so it doesn't have to be complicated to add, although it is, this is maybe not the most efficient implementation now because you're repeatedly solving these quadratic equations over and over. It would be faster if you hand coded a loop which didn't have to solve those things. It's just, it's just shift them. But you'll see actually on assignment two that there's a, a much faster way still. Uh, and so this behaves like an array stack. If I want to move i, if I want to insert at position i, I have to move n minus i elements out of the way. And if I want to remove from position i, then I have to take n minus i elements and push them back on position to, to fill in the gap that I've, I've removed. But, uh, but that still has the same, same behavior as, uh, as an array set. So the theorem that you get from all of this is that Thank you. 
space. Performance characteristics, at least with the big O notation, uh, as, as an array list, but it doesn't waste much extra space at all. So, seems like a useful, useful thing to have. Uh, so, here's a question for you. <clears throat> this seems to be bring us back to great. It doesn't use much extra space. But we've seen data structures like array decks and dual array decks, where this time here was faster, where this time was order min i n minus i plus one. So that's certainly smaller because this has a min around it, so it's always smaller than, than this thing. Um, what if we wanted a data structure with that kind of speed? but that also only wasted square root and extra space. Do we know how to do that already? Yep. Um, I'm not obvious how to make it circular because of the mirrors. What happens when you cycle off the, the end? Yeah. Yeah. We've seen that if I take two stacks, and glue them back together, back to back like this. That's how I get this dual array deck. And I don't care how these stacks are implemented, as long as they're fast to access at their tails, at the, the ends of them. So these things could, these two stacks that I use, they could be array lists, slash, what the book calls an array stack. But you can also put a rootish array stack here. Then you get the same speed up. It's fast to access at this end. It's fast to access at this end. But you still only have this square root n wasted space. So I mean, that sort of answers the question, why did we bother with these dual array uh, decks when we already saw that circular lists have the same kind of performance, that uh, the, the circular array decks have the same kind of performance? Well, this dual array deck is really just a transformation that says, if you give me a stack, I can give you a deck. And if your stack has certain properties, like not using much space, well then the deck that you get from this also doesn't use much space. So it's, uh, it's just a handy transformation to, to take a stack and turn it into a deck. Um, I think that's probably where we should, uh, we should leave it today.
Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. 